How's everyone doing today? My name is Yupari and I'd like to welcome you to this week's portrait painting demonstration. This video is going to be a little over an hour long containing real-time painting footage uh, with my palette of course side by side with my painting as I guide you along uh, every step of the way trying to clarify everything as I go. What you're seeing here is my new palette setup. I believe this is the third week now, uh, or the third video that I've used this palette, and I really like it. Uh, it's just a regular glass, uh, glass palette with a neutral gray acrylic uh, paint on the background. And of course, it does create some problems with glare here and there, but uh, just with a little bit of uh, camera movement and adjustment, I should be able to eliminate some of the glare. And in this week's video, we're going to be using another limited palette that I'd like to explain. This limited palette is just a six color palette. I have two dots of titanium white, burnt umber, cadmium red medium, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, and ivory black. Just six colors. I know I might look confusing with the two dots of white. Those two dots are just to keep uh, more clean puddles of white. But there you have it, just six colors that I will be using. And um, in this shot, you'll be able to see the actual paint tubes that I used. I know it may seem like I work for gambling or something like that, but I assure you that I don't. Uh, nobody is sponsoring me to show you this particular brand or these particular paints. Uh, believe me, if you want to use something like Grumbacher or Winsor and Newton, that would work just fine. Or if you have uh, the more exotic paints like Vasari or Old Holland or what have you, I'm sure they will work just fine artist grade oil paints. And uh, I'm also going to be using a different medium now. The left of my cup will contain my regular odorless mineral spirits and the right will contain a new medium, a fast dry medium uh, made by Gamblin. And I'd like to reiterate, I am not being sponsored by Gamblin. I'm not trying to endorse any kind of brand or anything like that. Uh, I just wanted to try a fast drawing medium and this uh, Galkid, if that's how you say it, Galkid, I don't know how you say it, but that's the medium I'll be using. Here's the picture, the photo reference of the model, and I will keep that photograph uh, to the right of my surface now. I edit it in there so you can see the picture throughout the entire painting. Uh, through popular request, I have placed that picture to the right. Getting started with the painting here, I'd like to also note that my odorless mineral spirits and my medium will be below the camera, so you won't actually see me using it, uh, but trust me, I will try not to use too much of my paint thinner, uh, unless I have to, of course, clean off a brush, or too much of my medium. The medium is just to uh, increase the fluidity of the oil paint and that's about it. So if you're ever wondering throughout this video how am I using that medium, I assure you all I'm doing is dipping the brush into the medium a little bit just before I uh, dip into the paint. That is all I'm doing in terms of using the medium. But now let's get into the painting. So I'm using a size 2 Filbert round brush. Yeah, that's right, a size 2 Filbert now. Uh, I usually have been starting off with a size 4 Filbert before, and um, I kind of beat up those brushes beyond any kind of repair. And I had this little size 2 Filbert, so I thought, hey, I'm using a size 2 Filbert now. And what I'm doing is, I first of all place my uh, place the large structure of the head into the canvas. I'm working on just a 11 by 14 cotton canvas toned with a neutral gray acrylic. All right, so what I did was I just placed the, the uh, outside of the head onto the canvas, and after placing where I think I want the head to be in space, I will start to subdivide my shapes now, a little line here for the ear, a little line across the ear to the back of the neck, giving me the angle of the head in space. Just a few straight lines and angles to give me the uh, general simplified shape of the large mass of the head. We just drew in that center line right there. The center line is that line dividing uh, the middle of the face. It's giving me the overall tilt and orientation of the head. I believe that center line to me is the most essential 
uh, tool as far as gauging where the model is turning in space. I have uh, now a mark for the axes of the eyes and now I'm um, placing a mark for the nose where I think the nose is going to go and where I think the axis of the eyes is going to go. Now let me reiterate the word think. I'm trying to work general to specific. Now I have been criticized plenty of times for being too general too long but for me I like to keep this kind of simplification uh, early on and use it as a scaffolding of which I can build more complex and more sophisticated shapes on top of. Now I'm starting to map out a uh, basic shape now for the shadow on the side of the face. Just a basic shape right now. I don't want to get too overly complicated with any kind of curves. Just simple straight lines and angles for the simple shadow shapes. I want to keep the shapes as simple as possible. Uh, so that I can work with them. I want to have something down uh, before I try to get too nitpicky about any kind of uh, superficial structures or anything like that. I'm just trying to have a scaffolding, if you will. Uh, notice that straight line across the side of the face. Uh, I have just a little bit of a, an indication for the ear and um, very simple trying to map all of my proportions out and now I'm using a size 4 filbert dipped into my odorless mineral spirits but just a little bit of paint thinner on that brush and as you notice I'm using that brush now as an eraser uh, so I'd like to call that brush my eraser brush all it is is a filbert brush with a little bit of uh, mineral spirits dip it dry onto my paper towel a little bit and then use it as my eraser. And oftentimes I uh, I find that the eraser brush and the drawing brush, such as the one I'm using right now, uh, they tend to work really well if they are bristle brushes. Um, not so easy to use if they're anything like a sable brush or a synthetic blend brush, which we'll be using later on in this video. Uh, but see, bristle brushes are very good at making definite marks. They're not so good at uh, making soft brush marks, but they're very good at making definite bold marks like these. And I like to use them for construction, uh, for my basic construction lines, my basic block in, blocking in the entire structure of the face with just a few basic straight lines and angles. And it's very useful for me to use these bristles, these bristle brushes in the beginning uh, because it's pretty much like a piece of soft vine charcoal. And now I'm starting to block in uh, the shadow mass of the face. Now uh, remember uh, I told you the order of the colors on my palette. So the one I'm using right now is the one directly after my whites. It is my burnt umber. I'm using my burnt umber color as my drawing color uh, because I don't want to start off drawing with anything too dark. So of course I'm not going to use my ivory black and I don't want to draw with anything too white. So I find that the burnt umber is a nice neutral kind of warm in-between color uh, that I can use as a drawing color. And it almost looks like a, a red chalk kind of drawing. So I kind of like that aesthetic with the burnt umber color. And I'm just, I'm just trying to mass in uh, the light and shadow and I don't really want anything more complicated than that. I just want to have my simple placements for the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the outside of the face. Notice how simple that these marks are and believe me it can be this simple. You just have to keep working at it, do lots of uh, quick starts, uh, lots of block-ins, lots of gestures, if you don't know what those words mean. Uh, the gesture is the overall dynamic movement of the pose. Remember that center line that I talked about giving me the orientation of the turn of the head? Yeah, that helps me establish the overall movement of the pose. And um, just getting these light and shadow shapes as simple as possible. Now I used a little too much 
of my uh, medium right there onto the nose. So here, I'm going to have a little piece of paper towel right here and start to wipe off some of that excess medium. Uh, just wipe it off a little bit. Um, but yeah, keeping yourself uh, honest with straight lines and angles and doing tons and tons and tons of starts. It's important to know how to start because why finish something that was never started? That's just my opinion. For me, it's very important to have a strong start. And a strong start for me doesn't mean that it's the most accurate drawing in the world. It just means that it's it's loose, it's energetic, yet it's still exact and simple. Exact and simple. That's the, uh, the key recipe, if you will, at least for me. If I can take my time and get the placements of the features just right in the beginning, uh, making the eyes uh, match up in space, the shadow shape in the right kind of direction, then I'm in a good place. And if I'm not over analyzing anything, then I'm in a good place. That's what I consider to be uh, a bold and strong start. Now I'm going in with a smaller brush, still with that burnt umber color, and I'm just very uh, simply now putting a uh, bold line uh, where I think that the bottom of the chin is going to be uh, the top of the forehead and the side of the, uh, the shadow shape. Just simply kind of uh, putting my foot down, if you will, for where I think these large proportions are going to go. And now that I have that block in, uh, roughly established, roughly meaning it's accurate perhaps to the width of a size 4 filbert brush, or maybe they're within, say, uh, I don't know, a centimeter worth of accuracy, meaning my drawing is not perfect, but it's workable. And so now uh, that I have a workable block in, I'm going in with my uh, dark mass for the dark region of the hair. Now you've probably seen me do this many times uh, where I start off uh, with a simplified uh, burnt umber drawing or raw umber drawing and then I go in with the dark mass of the hair. And so I don't want to put something that's straight black or anything super dark uh, right away so that's why I'm going into a little bit of my uh, uh, my burnt umber and my yellow ochre into this mix. Just a little bit of the yellow ochre will help uh, lighten up that value and make that dark mass a little bit warmer. As I fill in this dark mass for the hair, I'd like to talk a little bit about that palette that I introduced to you in the beginning. That limited palette, all it is essentially is the Zorn palette with orange and burnt umber added to it. That's all it is. Uh, well, now the Zorn palette had uh, lead white as opposed to the titanium white. So that is another difference there. Um, but I've, I've received many questions on what people think uh, is a good limited palette or what colors can I use? What, what few colors can I use to uh, create flesh tones? And I found that I really like the Zorn palette, and uh, you saw me use that Zorn palette before. Uh, and if you haven't seen that Zorn palette video, I'll leave a link in the description below. But essentially all it is is the white, the red, the yellow ochre, and the black. Uh, but I found that I, it took me a while to mix up a nice orange, and then uh, it took me a while to neutralize all of those warm colors without killing them off. So. That's why I added in that orange, uh, that cadmium orange, and I added in uh, the burnt umber to the mix. And I found that I really like this palette. And I've, I've gotten a lot of complaints on my colors before, and I, I think I've been killing off my colors a bit too much with that sap green or with the ultramarine blue. Uh, because if you remember my other palette, my other palette is essentially this palette, but it has sap green and ultramarine blue and a few other colors in it. Um, but I found that this six color palette that I'm using right now, that I'm introducing to you, is really, really useful in getting these flesh tones, especially in this warm light. If you look at the uh, color of the photo reference, it was taken under a, a warm light, not too bright, but pretty warm, 
pretty warm light, so I do like this palette a lot. I think that I'm going to try to work with these colors a little bit more. And uh, remember before, I said that, I don't know if you remember this, but I said that in a previous video that I believe that it's, it's kind of a good idea to build your way up from a limited palette. And so that's kind of what I did with this palette. I'm, I was thinking of the Zorn palette. I was thinking of the Zorn palette a lot and how useful that Zorn palette is, but then I was thinking in my head, I really wanted to get that nice in-between orange color um, that I just couldn't get with the Zorn palette. And that drawing color, of course, was extremely necessary to me, so that's how that Burnt Umber made its way in there. But Burnt Umber is also a nice, uh, believe it or not, a nice neutral color to bring down the saturation of some of the uh, the reds and the oranges. The only thing that's missing in this palette um, is that lead white. But believe it or not, I didn't really, I didn't miss it. I didn't, uh, I didn't feel like I was needing to have the lead white in there. The lead white I usually use is, of course, not a lead white, but a zinc white uh, because it's a transparent white, and that's why uh, people used lead white in the past because it's transparent and it helps you maintain the uh, the hue that you're working with. But in any case, I really liked this palette. And I, I thought as I was filling in these values that I would explain um, why I chose these colors and why I liked using them. And because I received many questions on uh, what people thought would be uh, such as, say, a good cadmium red to start off with or what's a nice color, a limited palette set up to use. So I'd recommend this one. All right, now getting back to the painting. Um, you saw me before, I did that basic um, umber sketch or that basic block in, and then I filled in a value for the dark mass of the hair, and then I filled in a value for the shadow of the, the face. Now, I'm going to be building my way up the value scale. Uh, as I mentioned before in several videos, sometimes, I start off with just a large simplified color for the face and then I sculpt it out and other times I work exactly like this building up the colors from the dark. Uh, it's really a push and pull. Um, there are many different ways to work and you can work so many different ways and achieve similar results uh, if you maintain the uh, fundamentals, if you adhere to the fundamentals of maintaining your light, your shadow shapes, and uh, modeling your forms. But in any case, I'm going to fill in now uh, a nice uh, warm color uh, for the entire mass of the face right after establishing, right after I have established those dark lights. And so you saw me mix up that value for the dark lights, and now I'm filling in a a warmer and darker mass for the values of the face but it's pretty much kind of in the middle range for the face. It's a mid middle end value uh, and it's a little bit warmer a little bit more on the orangey side uh, than I would want the finished result to be and that is so. Uh, I have a leeway to move up in the value scale or move down in the value scale and to cool my colors down or make them warmer in areas. So that's why I'm laying down this ground uh, for the face. I oftentimes call this a false color and uh, that's probably a misnomer. Uh, this color is going, to, uh, it's going to show in the final painting but this color is basically uh, you can think of it as kind of like an um, underpainting uh, for the other colors to rest on top of. And now I'm pretty much trying to work my half tones. 
I don't quite know where the final value or what the final value is going to be, but uh, squinting my eyes and standing back helps me see that this region of the face that I'm painting on right now is receiving less light and it's a little darker uh, than the area, say, to the right of the face. And I'm also, I should also note that I'm using now uh, synthetic brushes uh, to build the middle, uh, build in the middle stages and to work the half tones. And that dark light uh, being that half tone closest to the shadow, uh, I want this value, I want to nail this value at this point in time right now. Uh, because I've noticed with my previous paintings, just watching my painting process over and over and over and over again, that I keep going back and forth onto this dark light um, out of the shadow, and I just I want to get that value where I want it to be and leave it alone. And uh, that's something that I just learn over time to to look, stand back, look at my work over and over and over again, and making these videos certainly helps me. Uh, but that transitioning value from the light into the shadow, I think it's a good idea to draw out your shadow shape as accurately as you can, uh, as early as you can actually, and establish that transition and leave it alone. So I'm going to try and leave that value B. And so now I'm going to go into the the background and I'm using a uh, kind of a green a darker green color uh, I've noticed a lot of my videos uh, in a lot of my videos my backgrounds have been kind of similar kind of brown uh, kind of neutral which I kind of like but I should introduce some variety into the background and looking at the picture if I bounce my eye back and forth from the model and the background the background is, of course, a little cooler, uh, cooler in temperature, and the hue, I believe, is a little more green. I believe that the background is a little more green. Uh, remember, I'm not trying to nail that color. I'm more trying to relate one color to the other color. Uh, so I'm basically working this edge right now, just trying to soften that edge, but my color sensibility if you speak is what is this color in relation to the other color so i'm looking at pretty much uh the i'm blurring my eyes and lo looking at the light mass of the face in comparison to the background and i'm looking at the picture uh, when i'm making these decisions and trying to uh, implement those decisions onto the portrait and I'm also trying to uh, get a little bit more of an accurate outside shape as well, a little bit faster than I normally would. And that's because I've also noticed with my, uh, my painting videos, I tend to linger in the, uh, the general a bit too long. So that's uh, another thing that I'm trying to work on recently is uh, getting a little bit more accurate a little bit faster because sometimes I just don't reach that accuracy and if hey if I make a, wrong, a mark in the wrong place uh, like I usually say if you work simply and in such a way that you understand then your corrections will also be uh, simple in a way that you understand working with my uh, my little brush my little size one synthetic this is a very beat up synthetic so it's pretty much closer to a bristle now uh, but working with this uh, tiny brush i'm trying to now uh, further articulate where i think that the uh, the tear ducts are going to be uh, the tear duct uh, basically is the region uh, on the eyes where you usually imagine say a teardrop imagine a teardrop to the side of your eye and it's also the region of your eye that's a little bit uh, that's closer to the middle of your nose and so I'm trying to establish the placements of the eyes based on that tear duct and now I'm going to work uh, the values 
in between the eyes on that in the glabella region and uh, working the the side plane of the face. Now remember a plane is just a three-dimensional, a simplified three-dimensional concept of a flat surface and a three-dimensional space. And that plane that I'm drawing in right now is the side plane of the forehead. And it is a conceptualization of the curvature of the model's forehead. Uh, think about a line drawing. Uh, try to draw a perfect curve. You can construct it with a series of straight lines. And in three dimensions, it's no different. A curvature on the face can be described by a series of planes. And those planes are analogous to the straight lines that can be used to draw a curve. Now with this little drawing brush, I'm going to be placing the mouth uh, more definitively onto the face. And I'm going to do that by uh, with just my uh, burnt umber drawing color, uh, placing the uh, left corner of the mouth, the right corner of the mouth, and the center with just a few uh, marks of paint. And now I'm going to go in uh, with my my lighter brush and I'm going to make a mixture of my uh, my yellow ochre with a little bit of the uh, color that was already on the palette and I'm going to carve the more specific shape. Uh, I'm going to carve up a little bit more into the the lower lip and I tend to do this, I tend to place the shape a little bit larger than it needs to be uh, and then come back in and carve out of it. Uh, so that that's kind of a uh, painterly type of approach. Here I am uh, with that drawing brush now with a little bit of my cadmium red and some of the burnt umber making that shape for the lip a little bit larger than it needs to be and then back into it with a little bit of the ivory black to cool it down and make it a little bit uh, darker. I remember ivory black is actually, uh, you can think of it more as a gray blue. And so yes, it is dark, but it also has a cooling property to it. So that's why I chose it for this palette. Now going back into the cadmium red, uh, a little bit of the, uh, the white and some burnt umber to neutralize that cadmium red. I'm going to uh, then place another uh, little plane now on the cheek, uh, the zygomatic region, zygomatic uh, meaning uh, the cheekbone. Now this plane across the cheekbone. Uh, notice how I'm trying to keep it as flat as possible, uh, yet still trying to understand uh, the overall uh, big picture of the plane of the model's cheek right now. I know that it's curved, but I'm trying to get that uh, plane, that top plane facing the top of the light. Uh, so here I am now. I've dipped into a little bit of my medium and now with a darker, uh, more uh, yellow kind of on the gold, a warm gold side now, I'm mixing up a half tone, cooling it down with just a little bit of the ivory black for the side plane of that zygomatic region as we're working across the uh, side plane of the face now. Remember I'm trying to construct the curvature of the uh, model's cheekbone uh, with a series of first straight lines and angles and then planes and then carving into those planes uh, to create more of a, a subtle curve. So that brush mark, that just that big broad brush mark is going to be what I'll uh, leave for now for that turning plane of the side of the face. Now going into my cadmium orange, into my uh, darker region of the palette. Uh, remember I'm keeping some darker values on the bottom of the palette. And so now I'm going to be putting more of a side plane on the eye socket of the model's right eye, that area to the left of the canvas just a little bit more depth now. I notice that I'm working uh, all around the face basically. I'm creating uh, these planes now uh, for the structure of the model's face so that I can uh, create more curves with them later on. And I'm even going to go down towards the bottom of the chin now across to uh, the bottom closer to the mandible. Uh, now with my shadow brush, I'm going to be 
uh, re-establishing that shadow shape yet again. Now remember, I wanted to nail that dark light and that shadow shape as quickly as possible. Well, it didn't happen, uh, but it's all good. I'm keeping myself uh, organized with the shapes, and I'm trying to still build more accuracy as uh, quickly as possible. But here I am now with the uh, half tone brush, uh, creating a mixture, another mixture of uh, a neutral uh, dark pink now. And I'm going to apply it now to the other side of the model's uh, left eye socket uh, to create that uh, value transition uh, from the lights above uh, the, mo the model's eye socket uh, as it rolls across the side of the face receiving less and less light. And it's also a little bit warmer as we roll closer and closer uh, in between the eyes towards the globella region. And uh, now in the middle uh, range of my palette with a little bit of the cadmium orange uh, onto my darker mixtures. Notice I tend to uh, let my colors evolve on the palette. I'm going to create now another uh, darker half tone now for the side plane of the model's nose. Uh, I'm not trying to place too much paint down all at once here. Uh, just lightly uh, applying pressure to the brush. And now I'm going to uh, neutralize it a little bit uh, with the titanium white onto the gray that I already had uh, to create an, a more of a blue transition. I perceive this area to be a little bit cooler on the model's face. Um, as we roll across the the side of the nose and now uh, creating another value just another darker uh, warmer value and I'm going to put more cadmium orange into it uh, for the top plane of the nose that is the bulb of the nose I want that top plane now uh, so I'm trying to create this uh, simple architecture if you will uh, for the nose. Very simple. Uh, just the shadow underneath of the nose and then the side plane and then the dark lights. So now I'm going to work my way around the bottom of the nose um, above the upper lip on the side of the philtrum. Remember the philtrum is the, uh, the little teardrop looking thing above your upper lip. And so now I'm working this plane across the side of the philtrum and I perceive this plane to be a little bit cooler uh, relative to the uh, regions of the face closer to the cheeks, to the model's cheeks, where I perceive the model's cheeks to be a little bit more on the pinkish region. Here we are now with the halftone brush with the cadmium, uh, the cadmium red, a little bit of the titanium white, and then going to add some of the yellow ochre into it, and a little bit more titanium white. So you can see where I'm kind of going here uh, with the value range. Don't want to use too much white since it is titanium white and it's got quite a bit of muscle. Uh, so I'm now putting in that uh, lighter plane, just a little flat wash for that plane of the philtrum. That's what that light value was for, the philtrum. That little teardrop looking thing above the middle of your upper lip. And now with that same value, I'm going to pretty much put a strong flat plane on the model's forehead. And then I'm going to uh, adjust by putting some uh, more of my oranges along with the, the uh, middle values that were already existing on the palette. Uh, so remember, I used the palette uh, kind of to evolve my colors along with building them. So uh, I use some of the colors that are on the palette already kind of uh, as um, extra colors, extra puddles of colors to mix with, uh, meaning I dip into the halftone region uh, to get a value for the halftone and then uh, lighten it perhaps a little bit like I just did right now uh, with a little bit of that cadmium red and white and yellow ochre mixture. And so that's what I'm doing constructing that value for the uh, top of the model's forehead. And uh, now with the uh, yellow ochre into the middle region of the, the face, now trying to darken the values as it rolls away from that strong highlight and um, trying to assess that value. And I apologize for the glare on my palette. I, 
as I move the brush in this direction uh, from left to right, uh, I do obtain less of a glare, as you've seen on the top of the model's forehead. And uh, shortly I'll be applying uh, my palette mixtures in that same direction, so you can see uh, more of the mixtures as I go. And now I'll be using that same kind of value region, but I'll add a little bit uh, more warmth to it and then lighten it up just a little bit. Not too bright. I don't want this to be too bright. I'm going to warm it up with a tad bit more of the cadmium red now. And I'm trying to build a color uh, so that I can uh, further construct the top plane of the model's cheekbone. And so here I am constructing the top plane of the model's cheekbone to the left of the model's face and to the right of the canvas itself. Very carefully applying the paint, kind of whispering it onto the side of the face. And it's kind of like an ink drawing in the way that you, the more pressure you apply, uh, the more paint you apply. So uh, there are areas where I want more paint to be applied, like the lighter regions, and then less uh, pressure to the regions I don't want to be as dark. So uh, now I'm going to be mixing up a, a slightly darker and slightly more on the red side, uh, creating a pink for the side of the model's face. Now there are two ways uh, that I'm using right now to create value transitions. Uh, mixing the value, which is what I did for this one right now, and the pressure that I apply to the brush. Um, you may not notice it with the camera angle, uh, but I do apply less pressure uh, as I roll closer and closer to the side of the model's face Notice the direction of the brush mark from left to right, applying more pressure on the left side uh, than the right side so I can get a nice uh, value transition via application of paint as well as, of course, the mixtures of the paint as well. And so now I'm going to be mixing all the colors on the palette uh, horizontally. Uh, the brush marks on the palette are going to be in a horizontal fashion uh, so the palette has less of a glare hopefully that eliminates some of the glare on the palette uh, but notice how each brush stroke that I'm applying uh, is carefully uh, placing a plane and so that uh, brush stroke right there was a plane for the uh, continuation of the curvature of the model's cheek the structure of the model's cheek uh, so now back into my lighter values with some of the uh, cadmium red again to add a little bit more warmth and then some of the uh, cadmium orange now uh, just to add some more variety to that color. I'm going to be of course uh, mixing the paint in a horizontal fashion uh, now with a uh, pretty much loaded paintbrush I'm starting to create this top plane of the structure of the model's uh, muzzle. Uh, the muzzle you can picture as the as this area containing uh, your mouth, uh, picture yourself, or uh, picture uh, chewing on a piece of chewing gum for a very long time. Your mouth starts to hurt, your jaw starts to hurt. That region that's hurting is pretty much the uh, the muzzle. You can think of the muzzle as, uh, as I said before, a large, uh, large mass that's containing the structure of your mouth. It's the structure from which your mouth will emerge from. Now back with my drawing brush and a little bit of a, a darker, warmer color, I'm starting to uh, put in the uh, most emphatic dark light uh, that I can for the uh, wing of the nostril. That dark value that I applied was for the wing of the nostril. And now I'm going to mix a cooler color uh, by adding a little bit of the uh, ivory black, some of the white, and the yellow ochre to give me a nice uh, little light almost on the greenish, uh, hazy greenish side uh, color. And now I'm going to warm it up just a little bit again uh, with the cadmium red. So it was pretty much uh, white, ivory black for a little bit of a blue, and a little bit of the yellow ochre to make it a tad bit on the green side, and then a little bit of cadmium red uh, to add a little bit more warmth yet again. And so now this is going to be for the uh, another top 
plane region for the zygomatic bone. I know it seems like I go over and over and over on the same region of paint several times, but that's just the way that I work. Uh, I uh, work all around the face in this uh, planar fashion, adding uh, and subdividing planes as I go. And here I am now uh, redrawing the, uh, the model's eye with my drawing brush. Uh, my little drawing brush. So yeah, I do work uh, subdividing planes on the face quite, uh, quite, pretty much everywhere. I try to work the entire face in a stage like this. And now with my uh, darker halftone brush, uh, with a little bit of a cooler mixture now, cooler, warmer. Uh, see, cooler and warmer. What I mean is uh, cooler by a little bit more on the green side, but warmer meaning still with the warmth of the colors that were existing on my palette. I'm starting to subdivide now uh, the planes on the model's forehead, uh, creating that curvature, trying to make it more and more uh, of a subtle curvature of value. And now uh, with a little bit of a darker mixture uh, with uh, the ivory black and the burnt umber, uh, for the shadow of the face, now I'm going to try to re-establish the shadow again. Um, so oftentimes, as you've seen me do, sometimes I have to put a shape down uh, and sacrifice another shape around it to bring that shape back. So it's kind of a push and pull. Uh, sometimes you have to lose something to gain something. and um, It's just kind of how the medium works. Uh, it's kind of liberating in a way where you don't have to have everything like as exacting as possible, as quickly as possible, but it's nice to aim for that. And so I'm going to now go back in with my half tone brush uh, with my uh, value that's a little bit uh, lighter than that, that shadow. And I'm trying to, once again, reestablish that dark light. And uh, going back in with that shadow brush, I'm still trying to work that edge. This edge right here is, the, is going to be defining the curvature of the, the model's cheek, that division from the light and the shadow is uh, very important. So here I am uh, mixing a cooler color now uh, and then going back into the top of the palette with that cooler color that I mixed earlier to lighten it down. And this whole region here, this whole region in the on the bottom of the lip, uh, this whole chin region here, I perceive it to be a much cooler region. Uh, maybe not too much cooler, but it's definitely a cooler region in, in temperature relative to the uh, the areas of color above the, the lips. And the hue is, I think, a little bit more on the greenish side, uh, the bottom of the lips, and more on the pinkish side above. Uh, now with my shadow brush, with a combination of my burnt umber, ivory black, and some of the yellow ochre, I created a nice dark and more greenish uh, dark light, and then I warmed it up a little bit with the cadmium red. And uh, with a limited palette, oftentimes you really have to uh, think very uh, think very critically about the way that your colors are going to be mixed, and so. I do sometimes think about like what I'm doing right now uh, with the ivory black, uh, with the burnt umber, and then I'm going to uh, warm it up with a little bit of the red. Sometimes I warm up a uh, mixture first with the intention of cooling it down, uh, or I will cool it down with the intention of uh, making it warmer. So a good example of this would be in the beginning, remember I went a little bit warmer uh, a little bit more on the orangey side with the face, with the intention of building uh, lighter colors from it or warmer colors if need be. That was kind of a premeditated uh, color mixture for the face, and mixing the colors in the palette is no different. Uh, so sometimes making a green with the white and the ivory black and then adding a little bit yellow ochre can be different than making a uh, bright yellow with the white and yellow ochre 
and then cooling it down with the ivory black. So the order in which you mix the colors uh, does play a big role. Not a huge role, uh, but it does play a role in the way that these colors turn out. And so uh, that, that's why I think, at least in my opinion, um, I, I like working my way up from a more limited palette so that I can know precisely why I'm getting another color, what, uh, what abilities, if you will, does that color have. And I know that there are so many benefits to using extended palettes. And uh, trust me, I will get to more extended palettes in the future. Uh, but just for simplicity's sake, you see how I'm building these cooler uh, greenish types of uh, colors. for the. Uh, now look for the bottom of the uh, shadow of the face. I noticed that I perceive uh, this region of paint right here on the shadow of the face to be a little bit cooler in temperature uh, than the shadow across the side of the face. Uh, the shadow on the neck, the cast shadow on the neck, I perceive it to be a little bit cooler. And it could be because of some reflected light going on, some ambient light effect going on, making this particular region of uh, color a little bit more on the cooler side relative to the shadow on the top. Switching to my lighter brush now, I'm going to add more of a uh, light plane across the tear duct. That brush stroke was for the light of the tear duct region on the model's right eye. And now building up another uh, plane on the model's left eye as this region is obtaining more light. And I'm going to add more light on that top plane of the nose uh, where the nasal bone would be located. And I'm trying to work around uh, the entire structure of the face and pretty much the entire uh, region that I'm working on. Uh, uh, that is the shadow, the light of the face, and the hair. I'm trying to not be too fixated on one particular point uh, because I, I like to I like to work in many different regions and uh, at once and that's just the way I like to work. But here I am now with a different brush. Uh, so this brush is a new addition to my videos. I actually got it just last weekend. Uh, really happy about this brush. It is a um, I believe it is an acrylic brush. It's just a size one round brush. It's pretty much between size one and size two round brush and I'm using it now to build uh, more and more planes, kind of like a chisel. See how I'm applying the, the paint, just lightly tapping onto the surface, creating this plane right here, just lightly applying the paint, kind of like you would be with a smaller chisel on a uh, on a sculpture. Think about this as a large sculpture, and this is a small chisel uh, where I am holding the. Uh, the chisel on one hand and the hammer on the other, just lightly uh, carving my way around the face. Now switching to another uh, brush, a uh, another size one round, and this brush is going to be for the the half tones. Notice that I'm using it for the side of the face here that is getting a little bit darker as it rolls across the side of the face. So yeah, even with my smaller brushes. I have an order from uh, brushes that are going to be uh, having dark values, brushes that are going to have mill values, and brushes that are going to have light values. And you definitely don't need to do this, but it just helps me stay organized. So um, here I am now with a sable brush, and I'm just going to soften the edge now around the model's face. And I think it's easier for me to soften an edge than it is to harden an edge. And so I softened that edge around the model's cheek because I had it a little bit too sharp. And also notice that I've been working from large brushes to smaller brushes. Um, not always the case. I did use smaller brushes uh, for drawing, uh, but in general with the construction of the planes of the model's face, uh, notice I'm using this little brush here now to add yet another plane onto the uh, zygomatic region, uh, the cheekbone region of the model's right eye, uh, near the model's right eye. 
uh, now switch to uh, the darker brush now and uh, as you can imagine this brush is going to be used for a darker region and I'm going to use it for this uh, side plane, this dark light uh, across the model's forehead and I'm going to be um, trying to keep the same uh, value and color family relationship even with these uh, smaller forms now, these smaller planes. Uh, remember each brush stroke that I'm applying is pretty much uh, trying to create a plane change and so um, each little plane that I'm carving out now uh, is an attempt to make it uh, in that same value family. Remember I established that darker value with one big mass of color and now going in with the smaller uh, brushes to carve more and more uh, shapes on top of them but then as you just saw with my sable brush softening the edges in between those shapes ever so slightly and now with the lighter brush I'm adding another a lighter plane onto uh, the top of the nose and then across the side of the wing of the model's right nose. And so I'm pretty much just adding smaller and smaller shapes now onto those larger shapes that I had with my smaller size, uh, size one and size two around the brushes. I pretty much like to build the large structures of the model's face uh, with filberts, uh, but as I progress more and more into uh, modeling forms and adding smaller shapes like I'm doing right now for you, I will be uh, using rounds, smaller round brushes. And with these smaller shapes now, I'm doing something that I like to call uh, rapid mixing, like rapid fire mixing, uh, meaning that I'm pretty much picking and choosing now colors from my palette that are already existing on there and tweaking them just a little bit. Notice I added just a little bit of cadmium red onto that brush and then dipped it into the, um, the darker middle values and now I'm going to go back in with the burnt umber and the cadmium red into this existing color that's already on my palette and I'm going to be uh, applying it onto the side of the model's nose just above the wing of the model's right nostril then back into the uh, darker middle region of the palette to create a darker value as the wing of the nose rolls across the side uh, the side plating of the model's nose and I'd like to explain uh, why I'm rapid firing in this kind of way and that is because I established my large planes first, my large uh, color and value relationships. And I left those mixtures on the palette uh, because I'm going to, because uh, I knew that I would be building more colors within that large color family. Notice how I'm applying now uh, transitioning uh, value onto the globella. The globella being that region that I just worked on uh, in between the model's eyes and I want all of my color statements in the beginning all of my color uh, and value regions to withhold and to uh, maintain their relationships and so remember that I said the bottom now you can see closer up the bottom of the models uh, the below the model's mouth, below the model's nose as well, that region is cooler. The top of the region, the top region uh, near the model's cheekbones is warmer. And so with each and every little mixture now, I'm not trying to change the color too much, just uh, paying more attention to the values and applying uh, the brush strokes a little bit more carefully now, uh, trying to get that smaller plane change, uh, say the bottom of the model's eyelid that you just saw me apply that value to with just a single brush stroke and, and very simply. With my darker size uh, one round brush now I created a nice little blue uh, with my ivory black and a little bit of my uh, titanium white and I'm cleaning off the brush right now. Uh, you can't see it on the camera, but cleaning it off with my paint thinner, 
dabbing it onto my paper towel and then I'm going to apply uh, my cadmium red onto that blue and you can imagine I'm trying to create a type of velvety purple and that is entirely true I'm trying to create a type of uh, neutral purple but I don't want it to be too bright red uh, so I'm neutraling it down neutralizing it down with a little bit of my uh, burnt umber into the mixture and this is going to be used now for the lips the top of the model's lips are not bright red it's not as red as uh, say a stop sign and it's not as neutral as say uh, the surrounding flesh tones but it's somewhere in between there and so that's why I used that uh, kind of velvety purple uh, and then neutralized it with the burnt umber a little bit and switching brushes now uh, to my uh, light size one round I'm going to be uh, just applying some of the flesh tone onto the bottom of the lip uh, just using it to carve the shape now uh, for the the region below uh, the lower lip this plane here is just a little bit of a flat plane just below the model's lower lip now switching back to my dark brush I'm going to be adding just a little bit of the dark that was already existing on the palette the dark half tone and using that uh, to modulate uh, the values now using a different little size zero round brush uh, this brush here has a little bit of the uh, a white construction tape on it and and some of you asked me if I if I color code my brushes and uh, I pretty much just try to keep track of which brush is going to be doing what and so this little size zero round brush now was used uh, for a middle value so I have my uh, smaller round brushes I have uh, as I mentioned switched to this one right here this is my darker uh, little round brush and I'm using it to uh, create that accent, uh, the accent being the meeting point of the two lips to create that darker value. So I do uh, separate my brushes based on the tonality. Now I switched to that middle tone brush uh, with a little bit more white onto that uh, cadmium red burnt umber mixture that I had before and I'm just trying to add more of a uh, warmer transition across uh, the plane of the model's bottom lip and applying less pressure in areas that I want to be less bright with that lighter value. Uh, notice there's more pressure applied in the beginning of the brush stroke there than at the end of the brush stroke so that I can get more of a uh, value transition pretty much just by uh, the way that I apply the paint onto the surface. Now with my middle tone brush, my little middle tone size zero round brush, I'm going to be sculpting out the, the form of the philtrum. Now this little teardrop looking value that I placed in there is for the philtrum. And it is that plane in the middle of the upper lip creating that indent that you see on the upper lip. And so I used it to carve in to that shape that I had for the upper lip. Now switching to my lighter brush and starting to put in that top plane now uh, for the top of the upper lip. This region right here uh, as you can see is receiving more light. So this region on the model's face is receiving more light uh, than the area uh, that's a little bit darker that I placed first for the uh, construction of the philtrum. So now we have constructed that concavity of the philtrum. See that region that's receiving less light uh, and then the region receiving more light creating that concavity. And that's one of the few areas on the face actually that will be concave. Most of the forms are convex. Uh, but with just a light touch I was able to uh, carve out that structure uh, now remember, I like to um, I like to work with big shapes and create smaller shapes um, out of them, and so this is a perfect example of 
how I will be creating smaller shapes. I will be developing the mouth on this painting a little bit more uh, than I usually do. I usually leave it more painterly, but with this one, uh, we're going to add much more planes. Now, the previous brush stroke uh, was to create a region of the upper lip receiving more light. That's what you just saw there. Now, with uh, another highlight now creating the uh, the green bean looking uh, plane for the lower lip. Uh, the lower lip has two little highlights there and that's because there are two uh, smaller regions of the lip that will be receiving more light and now with my uh, darker brush I put in a little bit of the cadmium orange and some white onto the color that was already existing on that brush and uh, I'm going to be using it now uh, to create that plane of the side of the model's lip that's receiving more light uh, relative to that accent of the model's lip that is turning away from the light, that dark value that I had, and transitioning that value uh, from the side of the model's lip up to the bottom, up to the top of the bottom of the model's lip, and now switching over to my uh, middle brush now to just soften that transition. Uh, that brush stroke was a little too heavy, so I'm just softening it just a little bit and also creating a transition of value into the model's lip. Very few brush strokes here are creating uh, the depth of the form of the model's lips emerging uh, from the structure of the model's mouth. And now with my uh, middle tone brush, I'm going to be working the other side of the, uh, the model's lips. Uh, so the right side relative to the canvas, the right side relative to your screen. And now I'm going to, of course, overdo that uh, dark accent. Uh, you just saw me place that dark brush stroke for that dark accent. Then I'm going to carve right into it uh, with my uh, middle tone brush now with a middle value and try to uh, modulate the values curving into uh, the accent of the model's upper lip meeting the model's bottom lip and then adding a little bit more light uh, just to create that top plane. So that was all we needed for the model's lip. Now I'm going to be going in uh, with my larger size 10 flat brush and this brush I'm going to be uh, first creating a gray with it, a blue gray. And then I'm going to create um, a little bit more of a greenish color now with that yellow ochre. And this brush is going to be uh, pretty much used only on the background and on some of the, uh, the clothing that the model will wear. But we won't get too into detail with the model's clothing as we're focusing more on the face. And so now I've applied that value onto the background. It's a little bit darker, closer to the model's face and a little bit lighter near the model's hair. And um, this is from what I was looking at with the photo reference. Uh, the light was a little bit, uh, the background was a little bit lighter on the model's left side, a little bit darker on the model's right side. But now as I start to fill in uh, some of the, uh, the drapery now the model's clothing uh, now this video is more focused on the portrait itself and so the uh, the drapery is just going to be sketched in there not too much information is going to go into it i certainly don't want it to take away from the portrait either uh, so i'm not going to uh, over overdo any of the uh, the model's clothing i know some of you have asked me to uh, paint models wearing jewelry and focus more on the drapery and believe me I have heard you and I will get to that in future videos. Uh, but this one I really wanted to focus on this six color palette and I'm very certain that I will use this palette in the future. So now as I start to add more and more information into the model's clothing, I'm not completely finished with the face yet. I will uh, change a few things here and there and I will show you what things I'll change. Very minor adjustments. But in any case, this video is mainly was mainly focused on the usage of this six color palette. And um, now as I'm going to be filling in uh, some stuff for the uh, drapery, I'd like to talk a little bit about 
what my opinions were on this palette as well as that new medium that I introduced in the beginning of this video. With this limited six color palette, I had much more ease in my flesh tone mixtures than I had with the four color palette, the Zorn palette. I really enjoyed that palette, but I did struggle with that palette much more than I struggled with this one. Uh, with this one, uh, the inclusion of that burnt umber and that cadmium orange really made a big difference in my ease in mixing these flesh tones. I found that that spectrum of flesh tones that I was able to achieve with the Zorn palette, I was able to then add a whole another level to it with just adding that burnt umber and cadmium orange. And a lot of artists actually just use uh, a white burnt umber and cadmium orange for their underpaintings or their uh, what some artists call duotones. And so I thought, why not add that palette to the Zorn palette? Add two limited palettes together and see what happens. And uh, believe me, I really enjoyed this six color palette. As I apply these finishing touches onto the portrait, I'll explain a little bit on uh, what I, what my thoughts were about the medium. Uh, so now the finishing touches are going to be just this top plane, this final plane onto the model's forehead, and then the rest will just be softening some of these hard edges. So the rest of the final touches will just be softening of some of these edges. Uh, so now what did I think about that medium? Uh, so I usually use a stand oil mixture. So I usually use a one fifth stand oil, one fifth stand oil, two four fifths odorless mineral spirits paint thinner mixture. That's what I usually use and that's what I've been using for all of my videos. Uh, but with this one I wanted to try out that fast drying medium and that was because I wanted of course a medium uh, to make the paint uh, more fluid yet uh, thicken it where I needed to thicken it and I think it did great with uh, that purpose. Uh, but keep in mind that it is a fast drying medium and I wanted a fast drying medium, I wanted to learn how to use it uh, because I want to be able to layer uh, my future painting videos properly uh, and not have to wait uh, two or three days for the next layer. And so uh, this painting was actually dry the next day. So 24 hours after this painting uh, was completed, it was dry. And I really like that feature. Um, I can't tell you exactly when it started drying on me. I imagine if I used much more paint thinner or my odorless mineral spirits that it probably would have started drying faster, but I didn't. I only dipped into my medium a little bit whenever I wanted more of a fluid brush stroke. And so that being said, I do feel like that medium handled very well in terms of adding more fluidity to the paint without uh, relying on my odorless mineral spirits. And another nice feature about it is that if I wanted to, if I would have wanted to, I could have worked on this painting the very next day uh, with the layer, the previous layer being completely dry. And with a softening of this edge on the corner of the mouth, that will be the final change that I would want to make onto the painting. So there you have it. A portrait painting created with a six color palette. Thank you so much for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration. I hope it helps you out and I wish you the best in all of your artwork. Thanks again for watching and stay tuned for next week's video. And if you'd like to see more of my artwork in a more consistent basis, feel free to check out or follow my Instagram page. Thank you.